Okay, we're recording here. So we're here with Alec Marchin. Uh, Jonathan, I think, is going to join us on business development issues, but uh, we're trying to document the process. So we're in a messy process of figuring out the open source chicken enterprise where we're talking about compost piles and chickens uh, in an operation where it's kind of like Joel Salatin, what he's doing, except in our case, we're trying to focus on getting the feed costs down by using available resources. So big compost piles, uh, food scraps, awful that we can mix in there with the intent where the chickens are pretty much 100% feeding off of that. But also that means we have to move that compost pile around, have a lot of access to hay bales. We're planning on currently using our tractor. So that would actually be a small tractor, of a new version of the tractor based on last year's work which would allow us to test some of our equipment and um, basically equipment coming together and the business model coming together. And the thing is, I think we have a, if we talk about our, you know, our advantage, I think, I do think that the marketing thing is quite tractable. I mean, just, just kind of like to, to back up from the other conversation we were talking, okay, what does it look like if we produce a thousand chickens? How, how do we market them? Well, that's a definite, definite issue. But I think, I think we're in a good position with that, given that we have a following and all that, and, and it just will take some honest marketing and understanding what marketing is. And uh, I think the value of producing, I think the unique value proposition, one, it's like we're open source, we're trying to, to um, pretty much, I guess, a very, very deliberate effort at making a replicable model that actually works way better than Salton because Salton's thing, you know, there's a few people are doing it, but it's not really highly replicable. I mean, I looked at those numbers there. Uh, I studied those numbers a little bit, and it says that uh, with 10 to 15, I, I was looking at the Salton model, 10 to $15,000 of startup capital with 60 hour weeks for six months you make $25,000. Well, that's, you know, uh, translates to $12 to $18 an hour or so, which is acceptable. Um, but I think we can actually do way better. Like, like I was looking at their ratio, they make $2.50 on each chicken. We're hoping to sell a chicken at 10 bucks and our cost in each chicken will be a dollar. So we're making like $9. Like our, our return on investment ratio there is 900%. Whereas for them, it's like 25%. So I think we're trying to do, you know, sounds kind of crazy, sounds ambitious. What's wrong with this plan? It sounds like it would work. I think it will work. And then what we're going to see is that we're going to have, have the issue of marketing. So, but I think, I don't know, I think just from the get-go, I think it appears like a, like a winning proposition. Well, we have to make it work, but, but there's definite potential in that. So, okay. So let's look at, let's look at some of the numbers. Can you share, uh, send, a, you know, the, the chat box in the hangout can you just paste the link you're looking at right now um, so we can just basically go over that so what what's what are you looking at for the numbers so far we talked about at OSC we're actually a client for the chickens, so we can buy up about 250 chickens for the workshops themselves there's gonna be about 42 days of workshops uh, housing workshops as well as brick brick uh, production brick build brick machine build workshops and some others we're looking at the 3D printers running on a regular schedule. So we're going to have a number of workshops. We're kind of counting a, a rough figure of 42 days. But let's see what, what we're looking at so far for the, the numbers. Okay. So looking at uh, FBF agriculture from the 16 days of June, that kind of uh, Yep. There's a UPA page, chicken growth profit analysis. Um, it is in a messy state, but it's got the, the rough numbers at the bottom at the moment. The reason that the number is that we need to start breaking it down. I can't just say that we're going to get a certain cost of chicken. We need to break it down into whether we're doing this boiler, which is only you know, 34 pounds, or we're selling a there, and it's 55 pounds, or maybe still, when it's heavier, but it's worth less, or it's different kind of flavor. So I've been trying to break it down to those things, and I haven't got it together. Okay. Which, uh, which, so which tab? Like, Sorry, which tab are you looking at? Uh, chicken GPA. Chicken GPA, okay. Um, so, doing it with uh, 15 breeding hens. 15 breeding hens. Mm -hmm. 
you can see the you go the scroll down to below the cost there. You see the kind of numbers there. Uh, okay. So that's uh, hatching forty five ticks a week for thirty four weeks. So this is taking us to the end of October. Um, so three three eggs per week as that's that's every other day. Is that that lower? Uh, well, this is a conservative assumption. We assume that like okay, conservative. Uh, really well right away. Uh, we're going to lose some along the way. I haven't accounted for putting any losses anywhere else. But okay. It's so reasonable. Uh, either way, we can increase that number. Like along with the number to look at is a number that has increasing or reducing. Yeah, it's uh, conservative, so but that's good. To the, to the end of October, um, and the aim is basically to end up laying hands at the end, and all the other birds slaughtered, so that we've got, you know, we can't store many more than about two, uh, two fifty, two seventy five in winter if we're using the greenhouses in the place. Mm -hmm. So, we'll back to that in the end. So, the total chicks we'll be bringing through is 1,530. We subtract from that uh, 270 or so that we want to keep over the winter, that gives us 1,255 to sell. Uh -huh. um, we can start slaughtering uh, after about 12 weeks, hopefully. So uh, there'll be some smaller birds. Mm -hmm. we can start the run, so that gives us 22 weeks to slaughter. Um, the average number of kills per week there is just to, to have in mind for the labor component. It'll actually be spread out differently. Than that. So Sorry, um, your voice is a little. Uh... Let me see. Let me turn off my. Uh, maybe turn off your video because your voice is kind of breaking up. Are you close to the computer or? Yeah, maybe turn off the video. Turn off. Sounds better. Maybe maybe just turn off your video so you have the full bandwidth for voice. Uh, there's a button at the top there. Yeah, there you go. Um, okay. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, so, so this is when it starts to get really, really vague here, um, is pounds per bird, because I think that we're looking at pretty slow growth probably with the way we're feeding them and the kind of birds we're using. So if we're keeping some of them longer, then I think four and a half pounds a bird might be a decent number to work with, but we need to get into the details of like how many are we slaughtering as gorillas, how many as fryers, how many as roasters, how many as hens, yeah. they go on, what's, what are the actual weights? number rather than per bird, but at the moment, I'm still sort of kind of work, working to get those numbers together. This is what I've Would got. you mind sharing that doc with me for edit? Yeah, I should just send it to you, I think. Oh no, I got it. I'll cut this one. Right, I'm in there, but I'm, I don't think I'm shared. Oh wait, maybe. Compost chicken system, that's another doc. Okay. Yeah, I just sent you this one just now. Okay, the one with the chickens, let's see. Um, I'm looking at FEF Agriculture 2016 version 2. I still can't edit that one. It doesn't appear. Uh, I just I just sent it now. Open in sheets. Okay, I open it in sheets and it still has the private. It still doesn't have the uh, edit privilege there. You have me as editor? Well, oh. I just sent it twice to you. Did you, you click on the email for the uh, I'm clicking on an internet link. I oh, don't know, man. It's weird. It's not... Okay. Um, it says, yeah, it says shared with Martin Kapowski. Uh, okay. Okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, let's do... So let's continue on a FEF agricole. Oh, yeah. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, eh, I don't know what's happening. Um, okay. Ch Let's see. 
try it now. I just made it so anyone uh, open source ecology can edit it. Is that right? Where are we here on the uh, um, chicken flock? Uh, chicken GPA. The chicken flock sheet has gone, uh, has gone south a little bit. That one's got all kinds of messed up. Um, okay, can you paste the link of, for some reason I'm not, I'm having trouble finding the, the document where we were just looking at, can you just put a link, let's see, there's the link there, let's see if it works for me now. Um, you have like three emails in the inbox of me Okay, that. chicken GPA, okay, I'm there, okay. sounds good, uh, so... Right now, like down below the cost box, uh, where it's a little, little column that starts with meeting hands, just blue, and that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, uh -huh. right there. Okay, so uh, as I was saying, four, four and a half pounds of bird. That's the average I'm using just for the moment until I can get that yep. down and I've got the different kinds of birds we're selling out. Um, putting out $3 a pound. The national average for ordinary chicken is one fifty, so this is. Pretty pricey, but it's way below the price should, prices that we're seeing at the um, other places who are going for the kind of market price to chicken stuff. So maybe we can bring it down, given our costs. Um, but that puts us at thirteen fifty per bird. Mm -hmm. And if you just keep going down, that that means for the meat birds, the potential revenue um, if we sold all those birds would be a little under seventeen grand. Sells seventy five percent of them. Uh, it'll be twelve thousand, um, as well as keeping the other hands there. So that's percentage sold, percentage kept for hands over the winter, and then the uh, the total revenue after that would be twelve thousand. That's using twelve fifty five as the birds to sell. Uh, yeah, but subtracting from that twenty five percent, assuming that we don't sell all of them, that we don't manage to, to sell one hundred percent product. And subtracting from that the number that we want to keep over the winter, the hands, the laying hands to keep for next year. Mm hmm. So that means. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in this number sold, so if OSE gets 250, and I said like nominally 100 for me, um, that's 350. And you're saying the 75% sold includes that 350. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if that's mm -hmm. the total number that a number that some monetary transaction happened for. I mean, we could take the ones mm -hmm. for LLC out of the ones that we haven't sold, you know, but I'm just assuming that those are money equivalents. Uh, yeah. Um, Do you have a feeling for when you, if it's $3 a pound, if we're putting that into a dinner at OSC for one of our workshops, is that like how much we would be paying for chicken or any idea on that or like in a stuff um, we get otherwise as far as, as far as per person feeding you mean or do you mean what the internal price would be between uh, well if there's seven dollars fifty cents per per dinner does that come out to like if there's meat in that dinner like can we can we charge three dollars is that is that what we would get from that you know what I mean? I see. Okay. Um, well, this is just the retail price that I'm looking at here. We'd have to work out how to do, yeah. how to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's... That would be divided between four people, probably. Um, yeah, yeah, it's more... Yeah, it's complicated to really understand um, that. Okay. Yeah. Right now, it's working out the, the value of it, like how we work the internal sales. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. profitable for the OSC, uh, not just the farm. So, like, however we can do that so that it's satisfactory but um but for right now i'm counting all sales as actual sales um, just to get the actual potential mm -hmm. and so going down further there's good news on the feed front the original numbers i had been looking at those that's really for like 200 across in the fast growing ones mm -hmm. for traditional breeds it's a lot lower people are saying only two pounds for the first eight weeks and Carl Hammer, the Vermont composting guy, he puts his birds on the compost pile uh, and stops feeding after one. Yeah. So that's how the numbers got come down so much lower. 
Yeah, definitely. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, and, I, and some of that can be cash flowed, of course, because we only need so much up front. Uh, where we get into the costs with this, though, is going to be the freezer and the cooler and stuff like that. That's really going to be the killer. And you could scoot over to the right, um, way over to the right of uh, mm -hmm. cost. You can see processing equipment there in column M. Uh, that's not too huge, but we would need to have that uh, in place before we, um, before we start soldering. So here are week 12. Some of this we could probably. Um, some of this is already done as DIY. Like the smolder and the plucker. That's the cost of making this out. The killing cones. That's buying them. We could probably bring something up um, for that. So it could, this this could come down. Um, but that's about the minimal setup. Doing mostly DIY uh, stuff. And then, uh, do are, do they have any? Freezers. I mean, we talk about freezer, right? So, is there any DIY freezers out there? Uh, I haven't seen much on actual freezers. With the cooler, yeah, there's lots of stuff for that, but it's still pretty expensive. So, as far as having a cooler where you can store chickens to be so fresh, um, as well as the eggs, because we need some, uh, something to keep the eggs cool too. Um, so, if we could DIY the cooler, I haven't seen much on people making their own freezers. It looks yeah. like pretty, pretty hard to do. How much? Um, our freezer down down at the house there. That's that could fit like, what would you say, like a hundred, two hundred chickens? I think that's a twenty cubic foot, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking four times. Let's see. That's twenty cubic foot. Is that what it is? Someone, someone said that they get seven birds uh, per cubic foot in their uh, in their freezers. So I've been using that as a number. Um, if you go up to cooler size. Uh, sorry, freezer size. So average chicken size in the freezer is uh, 0.14 cubic feet. So we ideally we'd have something more like 30 cubic feet uh, to try and freeze 200 chickens. But if we're at 20, a 20 cubic foot will get you 147 birds in there. So if we just bought one of those, yeah, we should put 50. I mean, you could get one used one like that for like I don't know, a hundred. Yeah, I found a place that auctions off that kind of stuff, and so it's a, you can't tell where the actual prices are going to be, but it could be possible to get them cheap. I didn't see anything on Craigslist at the moment, but the, but new at Menards is only six fifty, so it'll be something less than that. Mm -hmm. um, for a twenty, cooler, for a thirty cubic. Uh, that was for twenty. I don't see any thirty cubic ones. Like after twenty, I think they're going up into like uh, big commercial walking pieces. Uh huh. Uh, but I can do some more research on that. That's just what I found. For the cooler, we basically need something to keep the eggs in. So we may be able to just do it with um, something much less expensive. I mean, it may be worth building a cooler um, because of the other marketing options it gives you later on. You know, if you do get into vegetables and stuff like that, if you have a cooler, it takes a lot of the risk out of that. Uh, but otherwise, we can try and fit them in existing fridge space. Um, I have to, uh, let's see, need about eight cubic feet. Um, for the eggs. Mm -hmm. so what, what do you think the that little mini fridge in there have that? It's like four cubic feet, right? Um, if that, no, that's smaller than that. It's probably like two. the The college fridges are like two cubic feet. They're like a that's a, like a college fridge. Uh, okay. But yeah, so we'll have to get something there. I mean, I put it in at the moment as a DIY. Uh, Walk-in walk uh, cooler. cooler. We're um, build one on a pickup bed trailer, sixteen hundred. Yeah, people do those things with the with the cooler. I don't know if you see that it converts. Uh, yeah. And it can just screw it up into a, a cooler thing. Yeah. The reason we do that with is that you can bring your stuff to market fresh and bring it back if you don't sell it. So like whatever operation you're running, it produces the best because it increases the market possibility. So if right. we're going to start to build one. I would want to go with that probably, but the other option is just to buy one for, um, for you know, whenever we can buy the second hand, is to buy a fridge. Um, whenever we can get some, that would probably be like four or five hundred. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've got that expensive trailer in the, in the 
in total at the moment. If you go up to column H, up at the top, like uh, row two. Yeah, capital expenses are three thousand. Expenses one hundred. The capital expenses there. Um, so. Hey, Jonathan. Welcome. Hey, let's bring Jonathan up to speed. Hey, Jonathan, so a quick summary of where we're at. We are in okay. this document. See in the right. text box. And we've been going through some numbers. So Alec currently has, if you look at column C32 or C C26, so we're getting... 15 breeding hens, 45 chicks per week, weekly hatching of 34. We're doing that for about what? How many? 40 weeks? 50? How many weeks? Uh, 34 weeks. 34 weeks. Sorry, 34 weeks of hatching 45 chicks per week to get a total number of 15, 30 chicks. And the three eggs per week, so that 15 times three is 45 eggs per week. That's a nice conservative estimate, assuming some of the babies are gonna die or whatever, so, but the hens should be laying um, like four or five eggs a week. So we got significant losses there accounted for. Total checks 1,500 or so. Then we call 1,255. We keep 270 hens and five roosters. We have 22 weeks of slaughtering, about 60 per week. Um, pounds per bird are 4.5, and the price per pound is three bucks. Tyson is like two dollars, or down to one one dollar fifty a pound for whole chicken. But in our case, three three dollars, which is still much less. I mean, people typically do about five five and above for the this kind of stuff. Um, but the the price per bird that we get is 13.5 per bird. So total potential revenue about 17k, assuming 75% sold. We get a revenue of about 13k uh, from that. And a feed is actually very amenable. It's one pound of feed per chick at 33 pounds. So so the total cost of feed for all of that would be 500 dollars for for the 1,530 chickens. So that's quite good, assuming the compost operation, which means that they're self-feeding off an input of straw and offal and other vegetable scraps that we provide. And then we're now we're discussing the capital expenditures like walk-in freezers or coolers and that number right now, which is in column capital expenses is H2, is turns out to be 3,000 plus an H3 variable cost of about a thousands for a total of about 4k so gross is about 10k at this point so that's where we got up to at this point Alec uh, to continue from here those numbers there that you just uh, coded that's also including the eggs um, which obviously don't get get into quite low under this system it includes uh, revenue from eggs yeah uh, basically about um, Go down column uh, F27. Uh, Jonathan, by the way, sorry for the, this mess of the spreadsheet. I'm in the middle of working on this out, so it's kind of uh, hard to follow at the moment. But we're down here. Uh, that's the, the number of eggs we get per week once the, once the main starts. So it would be. Uh, once laying starts, we're getting 800 eggs per week. <laughs> Uh, uh, sorry, no, that's the... Uh, eggs per batch of hens? Okay, what you've got there is down the uh, left, that one, one through ten, that's the batch ID, like the first batch that comes through. Because it will have nine weeks of laying, we'll get 810 eggs. That's the last month per week. Um, that's the total per, per batch of, of hens. Because they come through at different ages, you have to figure out, okay, how many, how many weeks of laying am I getting out of this batch? I see. Um, what is it per week? So at, at that point, you got like say a hundred per week. And then the next week, you added up another. 
Well, the question that's kind of like okay, yeah. The it's figure to question. really look at is yeah. Uh, there's going to be basically a, a flux of eggs at that time, which that number has to be seen. What is it at the peak, and what do we do about it? Because that's going to be a totally seasonal thing until we basically because basically everything is going to flush like the first mushroom flush, and then we have to ne negotiate how we deal with that. Yeah. One option uh, is to not worry about marketing eggs um, and only keep the number of layers that we want for one site. And, right. Uh, uh, all the females as pellets as well. They grow slower, um, so you're either getting less per pound than you would for a, for a male boiler, or you're doing it later, um, so you're keeping longer. But you can sell uh, you know, young female tickets. Yeah. As pellets. So we could we could try and keep that down, so we don't have to worry about uh, having them again to buy as well. Because it's such a short number of weeks; it's only ten weeks um, before we start getting into the winter. That seems like for this not to explode, like either we've got, we're just wasting, just throwing away tons of eggs to the chickens or whatever. Um, we have to think about, I guess the key to success there would be if, we, if we're working with the eggs would be to do the marketing for the egg CSA where we just do a route and we can actually get rid of all of that. And that, and assuming that it's not just, we're going to, we're not going to just quit at winter. We'll probably get... If we do the greenhouse, we are likely to get possibly like 50% or 40% of the egg laying in winter if we the have the... The reason up there is so that we can try and have a self-contained uh, unit of time for the, for the, for the profit analysis. So it's like, okay, we've got to make sure we cover our costs in this time. And then we'll have to go down to winter enterprises and stuff like that. Like, what can we do in the winter? What would be the, what would be the, the numbers of that? But I agree, that will probably be... Um, Mm-hmm. Alec, really quick, uh, would you mind sharing that document real quick? Uh, I, I, just, also... I just did a little while ago. Say again? I just did, like, two minutes ago. Oh, I'm sorry, it, it didn't show up. I mean, you, you, when you shared it, I, I actually dropped it and it came back and I lost that thing. Okay, there it is. Thank you, Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, Alec, happy birthday. Oh, thanks, man. I'm requesting access right now, and it, I don't have permissions for that document. There we go. Do you have it now? Uh, I'm requesting it again. No. Should be able to add it. You might have to click the link that comes to your email. I'm in now. Yeah, I'm in now. I'm good to go now. Sorry about that. So just a little logistical problem there. Yeah, yeah sorry about that. Um, are you able to, to see anything there? So yes, sir, I'm, I'm in now. And I'm able to see... Uh, Wait, just just looking at the eggs. If we got those hundreds of eggs, that's a thousand bucks. Assuming what price per dozen? Uh, uh, three bucks per dozen. Mm -hmm. Thousand bucks, yeah. Um, and again, again, putting in a seventy-five percent. Yep. Uh, rate. So. Yep. And I think there should be a clear market segmentation there, where we say, well, who's our market? Like if we're going to market it to yuppies, we can sell that for higher. But I, I think we also want to, we have to get very clear about who our target is. Yeah. Uh, because. Exactly about what the outlets available are. Like I said, I haven't been able to get the definitive answer on where we can sell different things. Eggs are pretty open. You can sell those if you want to market. So so that's, that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, I agree with that there. The 350 seems to be about the ceiling on, on the fancy eggs around this area. Oh, really? I yeah, I haven't seen anything much above that um, for the past few days. So, Holy cow. Uh, okay. Yeah, so it might still be expensive. Uh, 
that semi gate already unlocked. Uh, this is uh, not New York, okay. Or um, Colorado or Denver. Too many damn long yes. hairs in Denver. <laughs> Pardon the Denver crowd. <laughs> yeah. Um, so big big costs that are still missing from this. Uh, like just keep them keep the freezer and that kind of stuff. Um, like just the water pumping, gas for the uh, tractor to keep the compost and then gas for the truck. Uh, that kind of stuff. So there's still a lot that's not really um, in here yet. Mm -hmm. From my point of view, when I'm looking at this, it looks good, but I feel like there's a, a risk factor in terms of the, the weight per bird and the price per bird. Like, I think that's, that side of things is quite unpredictable. Like, How? You know, which, breed, of which breed are you considering? Rhode Island Reds? No, I was looking at Bob Rock because they're supposed to be uh, a bit bigger. Like, they're better as a new bird. A Rhode Island Red apparently been competing with the eggs for so long that they're, um, they've actually got really small bodies now. Uh -huh. Bob Rock is supposed to be a bit better. 4.5 sounds a little low. I mean, that's, I mean, are you, you, it seems like you're using the low values from where you're quick to slaughter, but we're not quick to slaughter, right? No, no, I mean, the earlier to be 12 weeks, but that would be a small bird, you know, that's, uh, at that point. That's, that's why I think that that's where the, the risk of these numbers being. But know. aren't, aren't the adult barred rocks like six to eight pounds? If you give them enough time, yeah. Yeah, but it's going to be, um, you know, six months or something like that to get to that. To get okay, to that. so, yeah. Um, so it's like, what you know, like, that's why I want to do this, the next phase of this, of tidying up these pictures, is to get something that can show us, like, if we do this many at this date, and they're going to be boilers, versus this many at this date, they're going to be posters and bigger bird. We can get actual, like, estimates of how many pounds we're selling, rather than just how many birds. Right. So that's like, so I think that's the risk is A, what what weight are we getting for the so like what's our actual price? And B, what price are we getting for the pound? Because I don't know that's that's a little bit um, that again depends on the like the, the details of where we're selling we're selling to. Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking at this, you know, I don't I feel like it's good. It should be able to cover its costs and stuff like that. But if we have to cover all the other costs that we talked about, uh, my my labor costs and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know if it stands on its own uh, in terms of being like risk free to do that. Like I think it needs it needs its partner enterprises to bread and maybe you know some small vegetables that are going to market anyway, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, so you've got some redundancy in the revenue stream. Because this is also the most expensive as far as startup costs. The other ones you can add on uh, basically with just variable costs like the, the cost for the startup for doing some kind of vegetable uh, So to summarize, we're looking at if the capital expenses plus variable costs are like 4K, we're talking about 9,600 gross profit. Um, so that's before uh, you know, labor and stuff like that. That's just on the expenses of doing the enterprise. Uh-huh. Labor was 7,200, so we got yeah, but then, uh, uh, 2,400. Like this enterprise only counts income that comes in up to the end of October. And uh, there'll be another set after that. So there's uh, you know, a few months of the year that'll be in the winter portion of this, of the enterprise, which will do the numbers more separately. Uh huh. So that's, this is really covering till um, about October, November, December, January. Uh, so like 10. So there's two more months that there could be revenue. I'm saying that we should do a business that goes through the whole winter. We should do uh, maybe it's like whatever eggs we can sell plus 
uh, whatever salad we can get, or something like that, plus bread. So we have continuing revenue throughout the whole winter, but that should be a separate calculation. You know, like those months of labor should be a separate calculation. Right so now, the cost we have to cover is everything up to October, because that's the, that's the season of this, this enterprise. And then the, the winter sales will be a whole separate thing. It's all the marketing added to the different um, production practices of the difference, and that's going to have to be worked out separately. But I don't think we should assume that all the revenue, revenue is going to stop. Uh huh. So out of that 9,600, there's less. There's like 6,000 because that's minus two months of labor. Right. So given us at this level, it gives us 3,600. Was that eaten up by anything else? I mean, there's um, the utilities, car costs. Yeah, I mean, the I think, yeah, there's still more costs to go into. This. But I've also put mm -hmm. something to my high, like if we're not building that freezer, that takes about a grand off the, uh, sorry, if we're not building that cooler, it takes about a grand off the uh, yeah. bridge price. So uh, again, it's like, just, I got to keep going until we have like real sort of detailed numbers, but it's, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the risk for me, the risk factor is the, the pounds per bird and the price per pound. Yeah. If you find it's taking like a really long time to get to Florida weight or that the market just isn't there. And all of this will start to look, you know, pretty nasty and quickly. If you don't have something else, that's that's not going to Well, as far as the market, I think there's a definite market for, uh, I mean, definitely people would be willing to order. So shipping is, a, is another option. I don't think we're allowed to. We, we can't do it out of state, for sure. I don't think we can ship. Just to do it. So without, without going to the uh, USDA? Yeah, the exemption for just ordering your own birds um, doesn't allow you to do it the same conference. Right it's now, it's, it's only in state, though. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we can ship. I have to check that because it's. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the rules of that, but at least for the poultry, I don't know if we can do that. But I'll have to check. Interstate commerce getting us. <laughs> Tell you what, I know, I mean, I'm just thinking because there's a lot of people that order stuff online, I mean, especially fish, you know, from Alaska. Places, uh, yeah, I haven't done any due diligence, and obviously you've done more more research on that. Um, yeah, my impression so far is that if you're shipping it, you have to get uh, you have to be USDA approved. But um, I'm trying to get a hold of some of the people that actually ask them about it. So here in Missouri, they do everything by county. Um, it's not I can't even call the state person. I have to call every county that we want to sell in to find out what the rules are. Not ready. I mean, one potentially realistic option is uh, the local butcher houses around here. We can partner with them for the USDA-approved facilities. That will be one uh, potential yeah, option to explore. It's going to take, uh, take a couple of bucks off, the, um, off each bird, obviously. I think probably like two or three bucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be a bit of a dent, but, um, but if it opens up the market, but we don't have it, it could be worth it. Well, quick question on capital expenses, expenses, and that's including what all of the materials and supplies and equipment that you guys that you need to get started. Uh, that's that's including uh, all the processing equipment, storage equipment like cookers and coolers, um, like the incubator stuff like that. And then the variable cost is everything that that would increase if you increase the number of birds and so on. So it's like the freezer bank, put the birds in, the the capital costs should be permanent, but it always should be still useful next year. Nice. Well, I like that you've, you've quantified at least, per, you know, some of the price per pound and even percentages, and we can probably get some more ratios as we get more data. But the, what's the footprint in terms of where is this or space and time? I mean, do we have a general, I know, I'm sure you're still working on it, but I mean, in general, blueprint and footprint of what, where this is all, what it's all going to take? Uh, as far as the uh, space, we're planning on doing it in the old greenhouse um, and fixing that up to be half, half of the, like the roof and half the greenhouse with, uh, with the glazing panels we have plus getting a few glazing panels in the fixed site. So that'll give us the coop in the, in the summer plus a winter place to keep the chicken. Um, and then having the compost yard right to the south of that. Um, and I've been looking around trying to figure out a way to do the processing and stuff like that. There's a few places.
guess it's in that kind of complex and it can make nice parts to the flavoring. Yeah, actually there's a there's a cold kitchen in there. Well, it's not exactly cold, but that one space to the left of the workshop was a kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, uh, that's And bathroom fun. combined, of course, but... Yeah, mm. I saw this in that one. Because you don't have the place that's going to be like full of flies and uh, any blood that runs on the floor and stuff like that. Right. Be draining. Most people do it outside. Um, so I was looking at either over by where the trencher is. Yeah. Be a little bit pump water, but it would be a really nice pump for it. Yeah. Or just to the left of the door to go into the greenhouse on the uh, on the west side under that um, under the roof there on the outside. So that way you're still close to the because I think the coolers and stuff would have to be in the uh, in that kitchen. Room, as you mentioned. But that, all that stuff we can still work out. Like that's just kind of my initial thoughts. Right. Um, as far as time, I don't have a number yet. Um, we're supposed to be able to slaughter a bird in 10 minutes. Um, that's that side of it. Maybe you have to collect once or twice a day. Um, we wouldn't have to do much feeding or moving of pens like most people do on these systems. But the, bird, the bird management would be relatively easy. Uh, the estimate on a pile moving, if you're talking about a tractor, so our micro track at 27 horsepower, uh, basically a larger version of that. I mean, I, I'm seeing like 15 minutes per day of turning. Uh, did you see the document I sent you just now on compost? Compost, okay, yeah. Compost so chicken I, system. Compost chicken system. If you go down to page 8 of that, this is just kind of thinking out, out loud about how to move the compost out of that pile. Um, so it would be once a week. Uh, a turn, or that week could be five days or three days, depending on how fast your compost is going. But it would be like a, a set time interval that you turn, and you do the, all the piles at the same time. Basically, it's a built through system where it's coming in as pile one, and so we're assembling materials and going out as each compost to pile six. So when you do um, your turn. Right. You see, you how do you. Turn. Wait, what's the spacing between the piles if they're next to each other? They could be, the spacing can be whatever you want. You can have it as a windrow like this. Um, or you can have them separated out so you can get more control over each pile. I would do them a little bit separate, but you know you want to keep the operation quite compact. Um, yeah. So it's roughly in the form of a windrow, but they're actually separate, uh, separate areas, separate piles. And you mm -hmm. start by moving up the one that's finished, and then just scrape the outside of of, the, of one pile to be the inside of the next pile, and then scrape the inside to be the outside of that one, and repeat it down the line. So you move each pile over one space and you bring in the assembly or mm -hmm. one consideration would also be dog access like if it's a long very long windrow versus a number of piles next to each other there's definite visibility issues uh say there's uh predators i mean a dog wouldn't see beyond this the aisle if the dog is in the aisle i don't know right. i mean i don't know how much I that i've I'd included in the cost chicken wire to Depends this area off. Um, I, mean, I know that's not, not perfect for that, but it's uh, it should be relatively okay during the daytime. But we can certainly configure this however. I was thinking that this would be the most efficient for moving, um, but it's you can certainly do it however you want. I mean, yeah, I think I don't know. I think the assumption there is that whenever the chickens are out, the dogs are there a hundred percent of the time. I think, I mean, we need to do that. That's uh, good risk management there. Oh, so are you saying no offense? No, I mean, uh, well, possibly if the dogs are there a hundred percent, then possibly, but uh, that would probably, I don't know if we're gonna have if they're gonna roam around. So you might you have to keep them in anyway a little more than just yeah. without a fence. I had a question too, like if, if we're doing fencing, is is a four foot chicken wire fence gonna keep them in, or we need to be looking at like a six or seven? Oh yeah, yeah. There uh, depends how you set it up, but uh, but if they don't have a lot of incentive, they just look down and they don't see that they can't get over the fence. If even if it's like two feet, uh, two or three feet, depends where the like if it's in the grass and they're kind of going through the grass and hit a fence, they're not gonna think about jumping up. But I I don't know if it's any way feasible that we train the dogs to keep the to actually herd the chickens i think that would be an advanced dog training trick but that's something we we should consider and maybe look into yeah. um i mean these dogs are are sheep dogs they're they're shepherds yeah. aren't wait are these 
Great Pyrenees are shepherds, I think, which means they... Well, there's a difference between a guardian dog and... Oh, wait. Uh, no, like they're guardian. Dog, it's not like, it's not like uh, a sheepdog. Or the sheepdogs that I've seen are usually different breeds. This is like a guardian dog. But, I, I mean, I don't know. That'd be great if we could do it. Um, I wonder if we could uh, train them. Yeah. We don't have uh, a huge amount of time to get that done, but it'd be great if we could. Mm-hmm. And there's certain advantages to having it fenced up anyway because you don't want raccoons coming and messing with the piles. Um, right. And it's nice to be able to, to be certain about the children where the chickens are. Um, mm-hmm. As far as related to the, you know, the garden of the orchard and stuff like that, and meeting the workshop, and just to keep them somewhat under control. Um, and we, you know, so while we're on this document, if you go up to page one, mm-hmm. this is just like trying to get like a an idea of what the actual stages of each thing is. So the top <laughs> line is, is leading up until the, uh, the point of having them in the coop. The second line is egg production, like what does it take to get them into the truck to go to market, the steps. Uh, and then the third one is um, is meat, like what are all the steps there. I'm just trying to do it so I don't make sure I like, don't miss anything as far as accounting for time and, and different costs. Oh, no, that's pretty cool. That's pretty nice. Um, um, Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, so the next phase, let's see, I've copied them on the next page. So the next phase is going to be going through each one of these and writing them up to see, like, okay, what are they? How many minutes do they take? Um, can we eliminate them? Like, there's some steps that I, you know, could possibly be eliminated here to make it more efficient. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's all the work still to be done. It's, it's just taking a lot of time. So this awesome video with Joel Salatin doing the butchering in front of a crowd. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. I think. So yeah, I mean, what do you guys want to uh, go over? Like basically, I'm at a point where I just yeah. Yeah. Um, One so, bird per cubic yard per week. Yeah, I is mean, that's this... obviously not a real number because uh, it depends on materials, etc., etc. But it gives you just an idea, like, okay, if we have the right stuff, what kind of size of pile we're looking at. Um, so Wait. if you're going along, uh, at the um, row seven, that's a cubic feet we would need per week at the block size. But this is going from the, the block size from the wall. Old spreadsheet, but if you look at the week, say, how come it jumps from J to K, like way from 17 to 117? Uh, because in this one, this might be based on bird numbers where we had a, an initial flock in. Okay, uh, um, as I said, this is based on the spreadsheet that I kind of abandoned at the moment, but if you go to uh, Say row, row one, uh, column Y, sorry. Like the maximum growth we'll be having under the, the new numbers I'm looking at would be about 500. Um, so, you know, maybe the growth might keep the growth longer, but somewhere around that range. So we're looking at. Uh, maximum is 500. So you're assuming that we've got constant entry and exit from the flock? Yeah, if we did. Like, I know we won't, but that's just to get a rough idea of like, size of block we're looking at. It could go a lot higher than that if you keep it longer. But if you look at that that portion of the table, you can see the kind of uh, cubic feet that we've been looking at uh, per pile. So that's the amount you have to put in per week. So somewhere around 500 cubic feet to 100 cubic feet. Uh, 
Yeah. Ratio. If you're looking at like a basic compost recipe, you want 10% of that to be uh, high nitrogen stuff like up or vegetable meal. You want uh, 40% to be greens. Like mm-hmm. So. 50% brown. So it's a lot of it's a lot of biomass that we have to make sure we don't want. So so say at column Y we got like 500. Wait, but you still got got it going up to like 700. So which one should I look at? 500 or like 700 or? So let's look at 500 for now and assume that that's. Okay. So we'll five. So 500 high nitrogen cubic feet per week is 50 cubic feet per week. Yeah. Meaning the awful? That would be the awful or fresh manure, like manure that hasn't been aged, so it's still got all its nitrogen locked up in it. Um, greens like and aged, browns. Aged. Yeah, so the greens would be fresh cut stuff. Uh, browns would be wood chips or old straw, um, dried out stuff, basically cardboard. How about, so hay, does hay qualify? Well, hay is actually a green because it, it's you usually cut it before the plant has gone to, to seed, so it's still got all the sugars in the in the plant. So unless it was cut after, like the, if we hay our fields now, that would be a brown because that was all after having it to seed. Uh, but it's not to do with the moisture content; it's to do with the nitrogen content in the, in the material. Okay. Um, so we have to be bringing in, you know, a fresh component. And if we had aged compost, like say Teddy was giving us older compost, uh, sorry, older manure that had been sitting for a while, that would qualify as a green. Most of the Wait, that would be a green? Yeah. So it's if it's fresh and it's still got all the nitrogen locked up and it's a, a high nitrogen component, if it's aged, like it's been sitting there for years and it's been gassing up as ammonia for a little time, then it goes into it being a green. And you can you know you can adjust this recipe depending on what you're looking for. This is um, it seems the most realistic one for us is the vitamins from the high nitrogen and way more on the I guess wait so dry hay that's still a green yeah if you if you increase your high nitrogen like let's say we had loads of them, um, we can, you would then reduce the greens and increase the browns so you can, you can kind of skip the middleman uh, on those but if you um, this is like the basic balanced compost uh, recipe adjust it depending on what you have. The guy who does it in Vermont, he actually starts with, um, with hay leaves, you know, like silage hay. So he's fermenting the hay first. Uh-huh. Um, and he cools grass with that for the first period. And that's why I want to talk to him and find out about that process and why he does For high N? What's that? For high nitrogen? Uh, no, for him. So his first stage in the pile is that it's, um, he's doing silage hay plus food scraps. Together, and then he does it. It goes into a thermal compost like this kind of compost. After that, after that, you can prepare that for a while. Um, but that's because he's getting all the food scraps, I think. And he said that the having the lacto fermentation of the silage locks up the nitrogen from the food scraps really quickly. Um, we'll probably be, be lower on food scraps and higher on greens because we have more access to greens. So, this, I mean, like, I think I we should, but, in practical terms and labor requirements. The thing I see as as being infinitely scalable is bales and offal. Where offal is a small fraction, bales are lit- literally unlimited. But as far as browns, if you talk about that, then you have dedicated chipping. And that's a whole, you know, that's a whole other operation. Right. You can do it by hand a little bit, but that's going to, I mean, you can do that. That's just going to be a huge labor requirement unless you go really high level on that. There, there will be a ratio and a turning regime that will to have hay and, and offal together um, to get uh, to get a file that works. I don't know what it would be exactly. Sorry, say that again. Now, to do a file that was just offal and uh, and hay, you could do that. You just have to figure out what the ratios are and what the what the turning regime would be to keep the temperature down. Right. Like I mean, because because um, what I'm seeing here is that in order to accelerate. I, th- I think we have to treat the offal as food for chickens and food for microbes and bugs. In other words, we would have to go with uh, shredding it so the one, the chickens can get it, and second, the, the microbes can get it much faster. If you leave it whole, they're going to not get, the chickens are not going to eat it much directly. So you're, you're waiting for a bit of time to 
for the bugs to build up, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, like, and also, we have to look at the quality of the compost coming out, uh, making sure that it's got enough of the compost to not be harmful. Like, if you do a compost that doesn't have a lot of grounds in it, uh, you might end up with something that's so bacterial that it's actually uh, not good for the soil, especially here where we need to get fungus in because it hasn't been, because it's plowed for so long. Um, but again, like I want to talk to the compost guy next. I want to talk to Carl Hammer to, to get his his thoughts on all this. Mm-hmm. How this work? Can so, you? So if you a subject matter experts. I mean, who are we, who are we pulling from in terms of the chicken and even some of these different operations? So for the compost, uh, I want to try and contact Carl Hammer, who's the originator of this system. He does it uh, with a company called Vermont Composting. Nice. He does it on quite a large scale. Uh, he seems like he'd probably be quite open to talk. He's got quite a big vision about how What's that. What's large scale? How many chickens? Uh, I don't know how many chickens, but the, it, it's a lot. It's several hundred, and he's got a lot of companies. There's a document. Um, from, uh, I know he said he's had up to um, up to 2,000 chickens. I don't know how many he has all the time. Mm-hmm. So he would be the compost guy, and there's also say to the farm who are doing it. Uh, it's like a different version of it, a mobile version. So I want to try and talk to someone there and see how they're uh, putting it together, how it's working over time. Um, and then chicken, we're talking about talking to John Suskovich at com. Yeah, John Suskovich. Yep. Yeah. Basically. Mm hmm. Uh, anyone else? Would be also Andre, uh, we should talk to Ron on the the compost aspects too, or just you know if you talk about analyzing the compost, he knows that. Mhm. Mm yeah. What about local? Is there any competition in, in Maysville, or at least I mean, as far as eggs or chickens, or who are the local producers there? I'm sure there's some. I haven't looked at the competition. Alec, what, how many have you found? Eggs, like you see signs for eggs on the roadside all the time. Um, so there's not going to be like a novelty factor of having local eggs. Um, as far as chicken, like online, I've seen seen people selling to Kansas City, um, selling fast poultry um, at quite high prices. But I don't know about it here. Yeah. What are the basic economics of a of a if we have excess of chickens and we have a CSA? What's the basics of the labor requirements there for if we have a CSA where we actually deliver? Like, I mean, see, I, I, I like the paper out model. I've done that for like eight years through elementary school, high school, and college, actually. So it was like 10 years of paper route. That model is actually pretty lucrative. You can um, easily, I mean, well, at least with paper paper route where you know getting very little per per paper but just adds up even though the cost like the first paper route I did was like the cost was 50 cents a month I mean a lot of people would tip me and all that but uh, that came out to like 20 bucks an hour actually which was really good um, so so heavy fuel costs uh, what about the time costs time costs I mean it would be I would imagine it would be less than going to a farmer's market. It would certainly be less than standing in a farmer's market. And you'd have, you'd know how much you would get before you come in. I missed the discussion. The the, the uh, you're saying. I mean, it seems like the the fuel cost would be much higher than a than a farmer's market because you're traveling. Yeah, but the time cost would be lower. Time cost could be lower. Like, say you got, you know, what's the real reality of you know just soliciting like ten or twenty customers within Maysville? I mean, I'm sure you can do something like that. Yeah. Down 
sorry, you cut out. Can you um, can you repeat that? If you're doing some kind of subscription thing like that, where you know what you're what you're selling before you process it properly, then yeah. your fees will go down because you don't have to you know, sort of need to go to the Which is a big advantage. If there's something that, you know, if that market is there, then you think like, it probably be worth going down to the sell a price to you. You know, say, say it's, um, you know, I could see something like basic numbers, okay, so, but I, but what are those numbers? Like, say you got 10 customers in Maysville, which I think is very realistic, and they're paying you 3 bucks a dozen, that's $30. How many hours does it take you to earn $30? It, uh, I mean, maybe when you get it down, it might get down to half an hour to deliver. You're just driving out there, but then how much time does it take to package? And It's an hour, right, maybe well, say an hour to deliver. Only, if that was your only outlet. No, but just as an ad added stream, like basically adding up to the t total time budget, how much time yeah, do you... Well, if you were collecting the eggs anyway and all that stuff, and that was one of your outputs, then I think it would be... I think that, that could be... I think that would make sense. We should possibly uh, yeah, consider that. Oh yeah, no. See, I think I really believe in that that part with the you just add that stack that little CSA. So as soon as we have any product, it's like bread, chicken, eggs, and that's a little CSA right there. And I, mean, I, I think maybe something that would work better for that than CSA would be like a, a weekly book where you you know you tell us at the beginning of the week what we want and we come to everyone on Friday whenever it is. And you, you know, so instead of them having to fork out four hundred bucks in the beginning of the season, it's just a, a service. Yeah, I mean, you could do like like a monthly thing. I mean, uh, yeah. a monthly thing could work. I mean, and then you'd get the loyalty, you'd get the experiential marketing there. Yeah. I mean, that would be really ideal as far as building building the market for future enterprises as well. If it's really local and really get to space, right? As your capacity goes up, you know, you've got a really nice situation. And you're not having to go to market all the time. Right. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. So, um, if you talk to to the guy, what's his name, Carl? Yeah. If you talk to Carl, would you mind recording that? Like, see if you can get him. If he can do a a hangout. Yeah. Or does he is he on a computer? Yeah, I think so. yeah. See he if you like can he record can... it. Yeah, yeah. that'll be good. I mean, that's I think that's like really cutting edge stuff. I mean. That's good yeah. stuff. Um, I, when I think about it, I don't see why why people wouldn't do that more. I'm looking at all these chicken operations, and everybody's got these um, these feed costs that get their chickens up to like seven dollar costs from the get go. I'm like really wondering why more people aren't doing this. Uh, it seems. Mar sorry, sorry, I can't really hear. Can you repeat that? The, the market for birds that are Cornish cross was quite strong. Like if you're trying to sell people a bird that looks to them like a pigeon, they used to use these these Mm-hmm. Cornish cross, but then you know that's one thing. So it's hard to sell these other weird looking birds that don't have much crest. And then also it's much more opportunity to do it. So it's just it's it's very production friendly to do it this way, but it's uh, marketing. Okay, but I think we might want to carve out like a, mm, like when we differentiate, like kind of like when we do the market segmentation thing, and look at who our customers are. Maybe like see if we can work out a sweet spot, and really focus on on that as our clear value proposition and so forth. Um, it seems like so, because I I see this advantage. If we're not stressed on feed cost, then we can get them to the relatively very decent size um, and then we can really propose that strategy as okay you get them as large as possible at minimal cost and that's kind of like our market niche those that kind of operation something like that I mean yeah, I think there's some sweet spot we can figure out here because yeah anyway that's um, got to look at the numbers okay um, next steps here Keep 
crunch the numbers, talk to Carl Hammer, and talk to the legal people. Uh, okay. And about that, like, I just have that. Okay. And, and are you, um, do you want to maybe do that? And do you want to talk next after you do that and, and do the bread or wait till we nail the chicken? I mean, I think you kind of got to do the bread thing because you got to see how the numbers add up or maybe add the other features so we can see how it fits together with the yeah. time budgets as well. Yeah, we found, found something. I, I, have a, I have a suggestion. Um, I mean, I know it's, 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 just an, it's just a thought and just something to think about, but consider the fact that, you know, if there was like a storefront uh, or at least a building that you could actually put as a little store there, uh, somewhere on Factory Farm, just something to think about over time. Yeah. But having that set up, could set up your know, market days or a specific festival or an event, especially during high harvest days, that people can come out, you know, for a one one time deal or whatever that, you know, would be willing to make that drive, and just you know, of course, marketing that very well in terms of education or fun or whatever else. I mean, it's just a suggestion in terms of maybe perhaps long term having a a storefront to have different things ready so that when you do have product and people come, there is a place for them to go and shop. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a good idea to set up as far as uh, a good thing to start if they come to you. That's the only story or something like that. The conversation is really good in most ways. It's just hard to get them in initially. Also, we got to get them to the point where it looks really nice. You can't get them. Like, if they're not doing any. I mean, I'm not going to stop this year. The problem is still going to be the best. The problem is going to be hard to sell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would be proper sequencing. What what do we want to roll in at what time? Yeah. I think, you know, starting out, if we did focus on the maze world sales, we're not going to that could lead to that. Then. Okay, and Jonathan, um, other note to bring up about, so we were, um, Alec, we were looking at core enterprise training. We found a, a pretty nice MOOC, pretty nice MOOC on, um, on marketing. I looked, I actually looked at it yesterday. I ended up watching the whole thing because it was pretty good. Um, really good. It's, uh, <laughs> it's so good. Well, it was, I mean, it had concepts. It didn't have like stupid shit all over the place. It was, it was good concepts, things to think about definitely as we, <laughs> as we move forward. That's on my log. If you want to uh, access that, it's um. Let's see, yeah, open source product development. No, organizational core training. It's on under yesterday's. Uh, look at this thing. Let me just send you a link here. Um, it's right there. But I, I found it quite useful. I, if you have time, do take a look at it. It does talk about relevant marketing concepts, and I actually put in a discuss underneath that. Uh, for some of the main points I took out, but it, it does give things to think about how we position ourselves, what our value proposition is, how we do the proper market segmentation and all that. Um, so marketing 101 st and st strategy. So take a look at that as well. Yeah. What did you do all five weeks? Yeah. Well, I did the five, yeah, I did the five sessions. I did all of the marketing. Then I, I got to do the other ones because they were, yeah, I want to look at the other ones because, yeah, it, it gave me some ideas. I mean, it, it so one point is um, there's bundles of values in any marketing product. You have bundles of values, which are, and I won't go into that, but basically I, like the one take out of that was because of the way we do our product, they were talking about, oh, well, you typically want to focus on one of them. I think we actually have three of all, all those values that we were talking about. So actually look at that. I think that's actually quite encouraging. Um, and then there was a no, notion of market orientations. There are four market orientations, like experiential, customer-based, producer-based, and something else, I forget. Um, yeah. And, and it turns out OSE appears to be well-positioned in not one, but actually all four of them. And we should really think about how to leverage that. Because I think we've got, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I I found a few of these concepts really useful in there, so I would I would I would recommend it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So anyway, uh, Alec, when when would you like to talk next about it to nail this? Because I mean, I think we're working and we're in the middle of it. Um, yeah. I, I think you're doing good number. Friday, sure. Yeah, let's do Friday at the same time. Let's do it at the same time, yeah. see what you get by then. See if you can nail this sucker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Or <laughs> a spreadsheet hell for me. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, and then we can we can do that. We can nail the business models. And then we want to talk about uh, pretty much committing to a plan for the year with uh, here's the milestones and sequences so we can write an agreement that can be evaluated because we can't evaluate it. Uh, we don't know what we're doing. Right. So, oh, by the way, one uh, opportunity which I haven't backed into this is that if the system is working, yeah. uh, by the end of the season, we could probably do a workshop on it. So maybe in September, Absolutely. We, work, we can get a couple of bands coming in as a workshop teaching the system. So, oh, man, that would be... Whether it's working or you know, like if it's going great, then yeah, I think it would sell, sell really well. But, uh, you know, I think um, whatever results we get to, I think... What we have to offer in terms of the whole system of the compost, combined with open source equipment, with our willingness to share that, I think we can do a really compelling workshop. I think the the chicken slash bread right there is a huge just the experience we're gonna get with all of that. I think is gonna be compelling for a lot of people to hear. Yeah, I, I like the idea. Uh, I think there could be some revenue from that definitely because our cost for that would be minimal. I mean, hardly any cost for that. We're not spending money on that. We're just showing what we already have learned. So the yeah. more we put in, uh, imagine if we have the incubation operation and all that, we can show all the pieces, walk a person through the entire full operation. I mean, I think that's that's pretty rare, and it's probably more comprehensive than Joel Salatin because, I mean, does he raise his own chicks or his own compost piles for feed? No, I think we actually got a few more elements that we can include in that, and he doesn't build his own tractors either. So, yeah, so. so we do have a unique value proposition. All right. Okay. No, that sounds cool. All right, so let's keep going. So let's do Friday at 1 p.m. again. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Man. Thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, Jonathan. Alec, great job, man, and happy birthday. And uh, I mean, just great work, and it's good to see a lot of the data coming together. So great work, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, man. I've got some, some real data for you soon, hopefully. All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks. Take care.